If this is $100 billion, then this is how much you'd have to pay to buy Apple today. This is the amount of all the gold in the world, this is the GDP of the entire world, and this is the notional value of all financial derivatives. They've become the biggest asset class in the world, so you should probably have a rough understanding of what they are, how they function, why on earth there are so much of them, and why Warren Buffett called them financial weapons of mass destruction in his 2002 shareholder letter and warned that derivatives could accentuate in a major way a systemic problem that might even arise from some other phenomenon. While at the same time, he also really likes to use them. What's his history with derivatives? Well, he has a checkered history uh, with derivatives. We have 200. I, I know every single derivative we own. You don't know anything about derivatives? Good news, I'll tell you. Sit back, relax, grab some popcorn and listen. The word derivative comes from the word derive, which comes from the Latin word derivare, which actually comes from the ancient Egyptian word for nobody cares. In the case of financial derivatives, this simply means that you create a piece of paper which derives its value from a so-called underlying asset. Company shares, a house, crude oil, your student debt, no kidding, pretty much anything can be used as the basis for a financial derivative. Even, wait for it, another derivative. A derivative is just a contract between two parties betting on the change in price of that underlying asset. And as the price of that asset changes, the price of this piece of paper, our derivative, changes too in some different way. The relationship of this price change to that price change is what derivatives are all about. It is the reason they are bought and sold every day in such massive amounts, for good reasons of prudent financial management and for crazy reasons of insane speculation. However, they are based on an innocent idea. Imagine your friend has a bike, a shiny bike, that he wants to sell for $500 in three months, because he'll be moving to... Hyrule. You tell him, listen, I promise you that I will buy this bike from you in three months for $500 if you promise me that you will sell it to me and only me then and nobody else. Your friend agrees to that deal and you write it in paper. Sign here and here. Congratulations, you created a derivative. A contract between two parties which derives its value from an underlying asset. Okay, I hear you say, but what do you mean this piece of paper derives its value from whatever you said? Say two months have passed and it's still one month before your friend leaves. And the company that makes those bikes just hiked their prices. Now your friend could easily get $600 for his bike if he sold it to someone else. Except he can't because he already has a contract with you which obliges him to sell it to you and only you for $500 in one month. Feeling a bit smug, you go to the interested buyers and tell them, I will sell you my side of this contract for $100. Then you will have the obligation to buy my friend's bike in one month for $500. Someone agrees and takes your place. Effectively, this guy is now getting this bike for the total amount of $600 he is willing to pay, while your friend is still selling his bike in one month for the $500 he wanted. And you are making a $100 win on your derivative two months after signing it. This type of derivative is called a forward contract, or in short, forward, and is one of the four main types of derivatives. All of them are contracts between a buyer and a seller, in fancy finance lingo, also called the long side and short side, and they are all zero-sum games, meaning whatever one side wins, the other side loses. How has your friend lost $100, you ask? Well, he had to sell something that's now worth $600 for just $500. In general, when two parties enter a forward contract, they agree to trade a certain underlying asset at a predetermined date called maturity for a predetermined price called the strike. And because people love trading forward contracts, some greedy bastards <coughs> thanks, had the idea to, instead of having to write out a whole contract every time, just copy and paste a few general ones that might be interesting to anyone. Like 100 Tesla shares on the 15th of December for $800 per share. Such standardized forward contracts are called futures contracts, or in short, futures. They are just sitting on the shelf waiting to be adopted by a buyer and a seller. Every day traders buy and sell millions of futures on company stocks, oil, gold, and you knew it, your student debt. And as the price of the underlying assets change, so do the profits and losses of each side of the contracts. Both parties can exit their side of the contract any time before maturity, locking in their profit or loss in that moment. And whoever holds the contract at maturity needs to settle, meaning one side needs to pay and the other side needs to deliver the underlying asset. No joke, WTI crude oil for example has a delivery point in Cushing, Oklahoma where millions of barrels of oil change ownership every week. 
Did you notice how forwards and futures give both sides of the contract an obligation? This trade is happening at maturity no matter what. One party must sell on date for price, the other party must buy. Enter options contracts, also called, you guessed it, options. They too are a contract between two parties to trade an underlying asset at a predetermined date for a predetermined price. Here's the catch. Options have one extra burn it button attached, which at maturity one side gets to press if they want, freeing them of their obligation to buy or to sell. If your friend had signed an options contract with you at the end of the three months, he could have had second thoughts, pressed the button and sold his bike for more. Now I hear you yelling, that's not fair! You signed a deal! Here's the catch for your friend. The burn it button has its price and you shan't sign son's reimbursement. Because special treatment requires special payment, your friend pays you $10 to sign, the cost of consent. Come maturity, if your friend wants to sell today, you will have to buy this bike for $500 consummating the contract. Rewind the clock, he doesn't want to sell for whatever reason and presses the burn it button, causing this piece of paper to perish, leaving him his cherished possession and you with a $10 profit. You just signed a so-called put option, which is one of the two types of options. It gives this guy the right, but not the obligation, to sell an underlying asset at a future date for a predetermined price. Put it on the market, so to say. To get this right, he must pay you some money today, also called a premium. This is a list of actual put option contracts being traded on Amazon stock right now, each featuring a maturity date and a premium. Pay this money today and you will have the right, but not the obligation, to sell Amazon stock at this date for that price. Receive this money today and you will be obliged to maybe buy Amazon stock on this date for that price if the seller so wants. That's the deal. You might wonder, who decides how high these premiums are? Why does it make sense to pay exactly that amount of dollars for this particular put option? That's getting us deep into the pricing of derivatives, which is a really big topic for another time. The simple and true answer is, the market decides. Just like the stock prices themselves. The reverse of a put option is a, you guessed it, call option. In our scenario, it literally looks like this. It gives you the right, but not the obligation, to buy the underlying asset at a future date for a predetermined price. To get this right, you must pay your friend some money today. This covers the main types of derivatives. If you're confused, rewind and rewatch. Those concepts take some time to internalize. Why in the world do we need those contracts? Wasn't banking just fine without them for thousands of years? Short answer, no. Long answer, no. The reason you originally signed this forward contract with your friend is that you really wanted his spike. Securing an underlying asset in the future for today's price is one use case for financial derivatives. A common example of this is fuel hedging. Airlines spend a lot of money on fuel, not as I'm making this video anyway, but usually. Companies really like to plan their costs and since oil prices are an absolute roller coaster, knowing where they will be in a year is tricky. Hence a company will prefer to just lock in a price today for fuel they need in the future. And guess how they can do that? Just buying enough fuel for a year would solve that problem, but you don't want to spend a gazillion dollars of your precious cash for fuel that you need a year from now. Also, do they really want to sit on a nuclear weapon worth of explosives? No. Therefore, airlines enter long-term futures all the time. They fix a price today for in six months when they usually do not take delivery of the underlying, but sell the contracts last minute for profit or loss and enter new ones for the coming period and repeat. This is called rolling over your futures. If the oil prices rise, they make a profit on their derivatives, which makes up for the increased fuel costs during the same period. If the oil prices fall, the reverse happens, stabilizing costs despite an unpredictable oil price. This reasonable use of derivatives is generalized under the term cost hedging because you get it. But maybe you weren't really interested in getting the bike anyway, you just had a hunch that these bikes would go up in price, in which case you used your derivative for speculation. When you buy a stock and it goes up, you make some money. But for that same investment, you could have bought, say, 100 call options or entered even more futures. It's called leverage, a means that a small move in the market translates into a big move in your portfolio. And a big move translates into a crazy one. But it's a knife that cuts both ways. If you are on the wrong side of history, your options expire worthless, causing you to press the burn it button, losing your initial investment. And if you used futures, you don't even have that option. 
Of course, you also could have used derivatives to bet on the decline of the asset. For example, by selling call options. You collect a premium, doubling your money, which you get to keep if the price closes below strike at maturity. Or by buying put options, in which case you make a $1 profit for each dollar decline. But that's all good old hindsight bias. When you need to make that decision, you don't know which way the stock is headed. And that's true for oil, crops, avocados, your student debt, all become bettable using derivatives and you better know what you are doing. And that brings us back to Buffett. The reason he called derivatives financial weapons of mass destruction isn't because they are inherently destructive. You can use nuclear energy to electrify a city or blow it up. Speculators make derivatives destructive when they risk money they don't have to make a profit they don't need. And that's just dumb. With new tech allowing everyone to trade derivatives more easily than ever, we need to be careful to not accidentally blow something up.